Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, the second installment of our uh, Jean Monnet um, webinar series. Um, the one we had before Christmas um, acted as the foundation um, for the EU foreign policy course. Uh, most of you already know what the course setup looks like, but it's it's an autumn. Um, semester followed by a spring semester, um, so roughly 24 full weeks in which we really take apart and deconstruct all aspects of EU foreign policy, um, and it certainly certainly takes that long. Um, this is the, the second installment, so having dealt with um, the rudiments in the theory, um, what we're going to be tackling from the IES, in fact, from, from my own unit here, the Educational Development uh, Unit, uh, and she's going to be following me talking about the European Commission, um, and then Alexander Matlar following talking about the European Council, so reprising what he did um, in his lecture to you, and um, Katja um, Biedenkopf, who has uh, just uh, arrived in uh, Brussels late last night uh, to uh, cover the European Parliament, as she told me earlier this morning, she, she will finish off the session uh, by being the voice of the people, and I think that's, uh, that's, that's very apt and Indeed. Um, we'll aim to do 10 to 12 minutes each. We each have quite a number of slides, so be prepared for us to, um, to whip through them uh, relatively um, quickly. We'll try and finish up uh, just before 1 o'clock in order to have about 20 minutes or maybe a little bit more um, for question and answer um, from all of you. Uh, before I leap into the content, I'm going to quickly turn over uh, to um, Alexandra Mehai here, who's going to give you um, a few very brief instructions um, on how to um, actually uh, manage the Blackboard Collaborate session. Thanks, Alexandra. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, just a quick reminder for those of you who already attended webinars and uh, some uh, instructions for those of you who are for the first time on our platform. Uh, you can interact uh, with us uh, in the question and, and uh, answer session at the end, uh, either via chat, so in the chat box, uh, writing down your question, or uh, with voice and even video if you, if you wish. Uh, so uh, for that, you will just have to uh, raise your hand virtually, of course, uh, and that you have um, uh, the sign for raising the hand is just above the participant list, a little hand. Uh, you give us a, a sign like that and let me know that uh, you would like to ask a question or to intervene, uh, So uh, and then we will give you uh, uh, the word. So that's just very briefly. One last thing to remember is that when you uh, will talk, um, just press the talk button. Uh, under the, the video box, uh, but remember to press the talk button again when you stop talking so that the others can, can uh, um, take the word and also that there is no echo uh, uh, effect. Thank you very much and enjoy the webinar. Thanks, Alexandra. It's important to have these uh, uh, technical bits first. I'm, I'm only now sort of getting uh, confident and familiar with it. Um, so, therefore, we're going to be moving um, through the, uh, the slides, and the first one you see is uh, EU foreign policy actors. I'm just going to move on to the, uh, the next one here. Um, the thrust, I think, of today, again, very quickly, is to touch on um, the, the points that I raised um, in, in the lecture, um, but I'm, I'm not going to cover in any detail um, what I took a lot of time to talk about in the lecture, um, and that's Hill and Smith's uh, tripartite view of the European Union uh, foreign policy construction, um, starting with its origins and then its um, sort of extant developments. Um, as, the, as you remember, they're very keen on, on starting um, with the common commercial policy, and I, I think that's absolutely right um, as, as the foundation. And they take a lot of time discussing that and development and humanitarian assistance uh, and then moving on into foreign and defense policy. Um, I have just one brief slide on foreign and defense policy to act um, as, as a brief reminder. But after we've looked at that, I think the key for today really is engaging uh, with what uh, the Lisbon Treaty represents uh, as a vehicle for making European Union foreign policy, the, the changes um, that it instantiates, um, and also uh, I think some of the challenges that it throws up because there, there's still um, um, an awful lot of space and scope uh, for us to truly understand what European Union uh, foreign policy is. Um, and how it's going to allow the European Union to engage with its actorness. You might remember this, this word, uh, this concept I, I used um, a few weeks ago, um, the quality of actorness with regards to the European Union. Um, and then I'll, I'll finish up with a couple of features of, of the contemporary European Union um, foreign policy. So again, I, like, like um, my colleagues, are going to have a few slides, um, more than a few perhaps, uh, but we're going to be going through them quite quickly. Um, you will have, of course, the option to uh, be able to access these later on, and the whole session is recorded anyway, so 
see or not. Um, here's a little reminder, therefore, of webinar uh, theme number one, and that's, of course, Acton is um, the Brotherton and Vogler concept, this sort of tripartite concept that looks at the form and the content of the European Union in terms of its presence. Uh, capitalizing on opportunities, uh, which effectively means reacting with logic to events uh, within the region and also beyond the neighborhood, and um, most important, I think, for Lisbon, capability, the, the ability to have a toolbox uh, to be able to use those instruments, to act consciously with those instruments, to do so uh, um, purposively. So the question, I think, um, for, for students and for analysts, of course, which you all are, is um, the following is Lisbon. Uh, a necessary uh, and sufficient vehicle for European Union actorness, uh, and in what way is it? So um, I think if I'm looking forward, not necessarily to, to the exam season, uh, but certainly you know broad scope-like questions, this is a very, very good one, a necessary and or sufficient vehicle. The social scientists among you will, will, will immediately recognize uh, those, those two categorizations. There is, of course, an abiding tension. I think we do sometimes tend to forget uh, when we're so embedded in reading and deconstructing the treaty, and that's, of course, the member states, the abiding tension that EU foreign policy uh, continues to be drawn uh, in parallel with the foreign policies of the member states themselves, um, and, of course, in relation to a very fast-changing, uh, hard-to-predict external um, environment. Um, I think it's always important to, to cast our minds back to, to the original historical watersheds for foreign policy. There's nowhere, in a sense, more important um, than the, uh, the, the master treaty um, and the five-point mandate, effectively, that the European Union, the new union at that point, set up for itself. Um, in class, we, we deconstructed these quite a bit. We had a look at uh, what, what is meant, effectively, by, by common values and security within and without the union, um, and the, the, the rather uh, high-vaunted um, ambition of promoting international cooperation and good governance. What is really interesting, I think, is to have a look at these words and then compare them with a similar mandate written in, in the Lisbon Treaty. And I have a slide on that a little bit later on. I can't go into too much detail, but you might remember the exercise in class when we, we looked at the differences between those. I think it's really important for students to, to bear in mind what has remained the same and what by necessity has shifted as well. So again, just a brief reminder of, of Hill and Smith's um, EU foreign policy areas, one, two, three. Um, and here's the slide just to um, capture again uh, the main points on foreign and defense policy. Um, remain still the, the least integrated by, by necessity area of foreign policy and still largely dominated by member states. Perhaps you could even switch the words around and say it's still dominated by large member states. Um, at any rate, it's provided uh, abiding foreign policy orientations uh, within Europe, uh, which uh, on, on occasion have stretched Europe to the, to the very breaking point. Um, and we'll have to see how, how that um, it can be repaired if it's viewed in terms of damage in the future. An Atlanticist orientation and a Europeanist orientation. So another question I'd like to throw out uh, to you, and uh, possibly uh, Alexander might be well placed um, in the question period to talk about this, is can a hybrid orientation emerge? What would that look like? What would that comprise? Um, in terms of foreign and defense policy, um, you have economic tools, diplomatic and military. Not going to have the chance to cover them um, this morning, um, but that's certainly something we've covered in class, and I have detailed slides on those, if you will. Uh, no doubt remember. Um, so the post Lisbon changes, which um, you're all very familiar with, which, which is good, but again, you need to really have these committed to memory and be comfortable talking about them, are the new posts created, uh, the permanent council uh, presidents, of course, um, and the uh, high representative also for foreign affairs and security. So those are under point one. Um, the new is somewhat uh, beleaguered European External Action Service, um, now moving uh, into its, its second year. A uh, variety of different types of responsibility, altered responsibility um, for the European Commission, uh, possibly a trimming of, of, of previous uh, wingspan, if you like, and certainly more say by the European Parliament. Katja, I'm sure, will be talking on that. Uh, the new legal personality created by the um, Lisbon Treaty for the European Union. No longer does the community alone uh, have a legal personality. Now the EU do, does as well. In my view, that's, that's a very substantive step forward in terms of making the European Union not only a regional, but a veritable international actor as well. And I have a few slides on that later on. Um, the new titles, of course, are uh, nothing if not a little bit confusing. And sometimes we, we are, we're wading in the, uh, in the mire of Eurospeak. So do bear in mind that sometimes you, you see ESDP and, and synonymously with, with CSDP. Just do, do bear in mind uh, which, which categories refer to what. And of course, uh, beefed up uh, 
political and military committees, which I won't have the chance to talk about um, this morning, but again, there are detailed slides. Uh, quick slide here with regards to the double-hatted qualities of the high representative, triple-hatted perhaps, I think, in a sense, if you, if you just extend it uh, beyond the, the Commission and the Foreign Affairs Council in that having to assume overall responsibility for, for coherence which is a very, very big task indeed as well. Um, I put a quick slide here in, in terms of what this means instrumentally to in, uh, increase the coherence and visibility, and more broadly to ensure coherence across the union's institutions, so uh, genuine bridge building across the institutions and policies in general. So it's, it's probably a bit of con, um, consistency as well as um, coherence. Um, I have a, a slide here where I try to map over the old pillars and suggest that now this, what this sort of um, coherence looks like in practice, ensuring greater coherence by moving from the original Pillar 2 system, um, um, blending it into the foreign affairs um, components of Pillar 1 and producing genuine union foreign policy, if, if you can, if you can uh, term it that. As promised, just a few slides on, on what um, um, the European uh, Union is, and particularly foreign policy in, in international uh, law. Here I'm indebted to some of the uh, work that's come out of the European uh, Commission Legal Service, which is very, very helpful. Um, first, the, the main point that the Union, of course, has merged with the European community, uh, and the new entity that we have is simply a continuation um, of, the fold, of the old, albeit in, in a different structure, in a different form. Um, and this, this succession, if you want to um, use a slightly monarchical term, um, has replaced the former community and the original union by the new union, effectively, in the responsibility for international relations. And the new union um, has uh, a foundation of two treaties, the, the TEU in its latest incarnation, and the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, um, the Lisbon Treaty. So you need to bear in mind that there's a, there's a duality, a legal um, a duality there, if you like. Um, so although uh, it is not a state, um, many Europeans would say, thank goodness, and others would say, not yet. Uh, the European Union is, of course, a subject of, of international law, which means the following. It can act in international fora. It can conclude international agreements. The question, of course, is who is the human face behind the conclusion and those negotiations of those agreements? It can also undertake cooperation with international actors, like the list I have uh, there as well, hopefully uh, more formidably in, in taking seats that are closer and closer to the center, less and less observer-like, um, is legally responsible according to international law, and of course, um, as you'll hear about soon, processes a right of legation. Here's the mandate that I think you can compare to, to the Maastricht one to see how, how much has changed and possibly how little has changed as well in regards to its ability or its desire to contribute to peace, security, sustainable development of, of the earth, which is uh, rather ambitious, solidarity and mutual respect among peoples. Um, to, in particular, a, a, a few more things have added the rights of the child, strict observance and development of international law, and of course this, the, the, the sort of uh, rock-solid linchpin of the principles of the United Nations um, Charter. So some things, I think, remain the absolute bedrock of what the European Union stands for, and others, I think, have been expanded to allow the European Union to engage with an increasingly uh, difficult uh, and, and wider world. In terms of competences, uh, the European Union external action is, is governed by the principle of conferral. This isn't terrifically well understood, so I think it's important uh, that you, you understand this, and I've, I've used only a few of the slides that I had in, in the lecture, um, to, the extent, uh, to the extent that the TEU has specified objectives that must be um, attained uh, in common, and only to the extent that the member states have themselves, to begin with, conferred competences. Uh, upon it, so don't forget the the consequence of which things happen in the in the European Union always uh, triggered off by the member states, at least in terms of foreign policy. The EU is not authorized, therefore, to legislate or to act beyond its competences. Although I must say delicately, I don't know if that prevents um, it from necessarily trying um, in some areas. Article four makes this clear: competences not conferred upon the Union in the treaties remain with the member states, which means, as I've underlined, that the European Union cannot yet go beyond the accepted bounds of the member states, of their own um, uh, national security, their own ambitions. All those remain the sole responsibility of the member states. Sole and yet shared, and again, you have this slightly tricky dichotomy that you have to sort of bear in mind. Um, so external relations continuing on, um, conferral governed by subsidiarity, 
and of course you know what, uh, what this refers to, and proportionality, that EU efforts must be equal to the proposed objectives. Now, subsidiarity and proportionality um, are, are easy to define in a sense, but very tough principles to prove in practice. So how do you measure efforts, for example, EU efforts equal? How do you define better? Um, in terms of uh, better things achieved at the, U the union level. Uh, so the, the sort of um, uh, practical material implementation of, the, of these sweeping principles are not necessarily easy. Just coming to the end, therefore, uh, a little table on the categories of competence. Um, I find this uh, very, very helpful because this, I think, has, has shared the, the spectrum of competence, um, I think, is clearer now than it used to be before, but each of these categories are, are more full than, than they used to be. So it's important, I think, that you, that you bear this in mind, CFSB, of course, um, coming um, at the bottom as, as specific standalone provisions. Um, I have a few slides which I'm not going to go through in, in, in much detail. I, I think one, one thing I'd like you to bear in mind is that the CFSP decisions, though legally binding, are not themselves legislative acts, which means despite having a sort of pillar's worth um, of principles and ambitions and policies, there isn't yet a permanent CFSP uh, acquis. I would say it has ambitions towards acquis-like ideas. But CFSP objectives um, themselves can be amended um, at any time without limitation, and the objectives are subject still to relatively weak parliamentary and judicial um, control. So there's, there's certainly a degree of, of unevenness. Um, you also understand, of course, the difference between the councils um, uh, acting unanimously um, and the council also um, on, on very exceptional issues acting with, with QMV, but has not at this point ever done so. Um, contrary to popular media, of course, particularly in Britain, if I may say, Lisbon does not prejudice um, and uh, attenuate or truncate member states' <laughs> security and defense policies. Neither does it give um, especially new material uh, powers to the Commission um, to initiate decisions. The opposite, I would say. Uh, nor do they uh, necessarily increase uh, the role of the EP, although certainly um, the, the oversight and the say of the EP is, I would say, um, extended. Um, just a, one, a couple of final slides, um, I think, uh, bearing in mind the, the, the sort of onslaught that the EAS has had. And if you've seen the, 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 the European Voice, <laughs> most recent uh, byline Ashton defensive over the EU's diplomatic service, uh, certainly the number crunching going on in the EAS, I think, um, is making the rounds in Brussels. Uh, I, in my opinion, it's, it's not nearly large enough if it's supposed to do what it's supposed to do. Um, we'll have to see um, how well it's going to um, move in the future. What it does not do affect is, of course, affect the existing legal basis of the member states. It's designed to be, and of course, I take this directly from the website, a more rational and effective coordination mechanism aimed at bringing closer uh, policies and resources and institutions, uh, notably. So in conclusion, uh, all foreign policy continues I think um, to be hugely affected. How could it be otherwise by the member states? As a result, in a sense, the present capacity of the European Union for external action remains unclear. And the European Union, I think, has learned how to be a, a very, very decent actor by trial and error on the inside, like, like many other member states, of course, and by crisis-induced learning um, from, from the outside. So that, in a sense, makes it similar to, to many other states. But it's problem, in a sense, is the unevenness, the EU's ability to agree on and use its foreign policy tools, diplomatic, economic, military, still remains uneven across each area. I'm going to conclude there, and I'm going to hand over, therefore, to um, Alina to move on to the role of the European Commission in external affairs. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, Amelia, for um, giving me now the floor. Um, I'm going to talk now about the role of the European Commission in external affairs. Um, Ten minutes is 10 to 12 minutes is not really um, a long time, so I don't have, um, um, you know, the time to, to dwell into detail on a lot of things. So um, what I'm going to do is just try to give you a rough overview of um, what the institutional maze looks like, what the competencies are, and where there is place for the Commission, and also to highlight certain areas that are problematic and to see um, how these problems can be solved in the future. So. Um, I'm going to start just uh, with the one slide that um, deals with the community method that's just for you um, as, as a kind of um, um, remembering of, of uh, what that is. The community method refers actually to legislation that has been passed within the former first pillar uh, of the European community that now became EU, so now uh, we would rightly um, 
be speaking about the EU method, not the community method of search, but again, I won't dwell um, a lot on this one because uh, Katya is going to talk more into detail also about this. Basically, the community method describes um, the procedure and the interinstitutional relations between the um, different actors here, like the Commission, the Council, the European Parliament, Member States, and also Court of Justice uh, in passing legislation and also implementing this. Um, and um, the next slide I have here is a deal with the European Commission just for the general rules it has so that you uh, know where to place it. So uh, basically the Commission has four main rules. It proposes legislation. It has the monopoly to propose legislation to the Parliament and the Council. This is quite a strong right that it exercises. It manages and implements EU policies and budgets, enforces European law together with the Court of Justice, but it also represents the EU on the international stage. And um, now here, basically, we come to the core of uh, my presentation, the external representation. And before talking only about the Commission, I'll just mention a, a few important points here. Um, external representation is guided by two principles that are quite crucial for, for, for this area, and this is the principle of conferral of powers that Amelia already um, spoke about, and the principle of distribution of powers between the different institutions. So um, again, I won't dwell for a long time on the principle of conferral of powers, of powers, but basically what it says is that the EU can become active on the international stage only when member states have um, uh, basically decided to act together uh, in certain areas and have um, transferred their um, competencies from the member state level to the EU level. Otherwise, the EU is not allowed to act. And the principle of distribution of powers between the different institutions is a similar principle that talks about um, the competences of each institution. So an institution, a EU institution, can only become active if the member states have conferred uh, the respective powers to the EU. And um, this, of course, is uh, written down in the treaties. And uh, basically, the, every institution is also obliged to follow the procedures that are also set out in the treaty. So as a general principle, um, if you want to know what um, the different actors are allowed or not allowed to do, it's uh, always quite a good idea to take a look at the, at, at the treaties because this is the foundation uh, upon which the European Union acts. So these are two principles to, to, to keep in the back of your mind for later because I'm going to talk about one certain case where uh, we have huge problems also between the different institutions with regard to external representation and there I'm going uh, to remind you of these principles. So if we take a look at, um, into the Lisbon Treaty, of course, we'll see that uh, as far as external representation is concerned, there is a clear division between CFSP and non-CFSP matters. So with regard to CFSP, the treaties are quite clear. Um, and here I'm referring to these Articles 15 and Articles 27, because they say that in CFSP matters, external representation is ensured by the President of the European Council for his level, that means the level of heads of state and government, and the high representative, that's for the ministerial level. With regard to non-CSSP matters, external representation is entrusted to the Commission, and that's uh, stated very clearly in Article 7 of the Treaty uh, on the European Union. So that's basically the dividing line. Um, but how does the Commission represent the European Union with regard to non-CSSP matters? And here we come back also to the different types of competences or external competences that are set out in the treaties. And this is also something that the media has, has, has mentioned already, uh, the different type of competences here. You, you, you see an overview again about exclusive shared competences and also the coordination of economic, employment, social policies, and also actions to support, coordinate, to supplement actions of member states, and also CFSP, which is subject to, to special type of rules. So here I'm going to concentrate on the first two namely on exclusive competences and on the shared competences. So exclusive competences means that the member states have transferred their competencies once and for all to the European Union level and are not allowed to take any actions in these areas anymore. Shared competences, we still have a division between member states and the European Union. So there is a transfer of competences and the EU can become active. And once the EU has become active, then member states lose their right um, to pass legislation in this area. So this is what um, here the next um, slide um, allures to. So if we take a look at the 
uh, competences of external representation that are entrusted to the Commission, of course the Commission has uh, a quite unlimited right to represent the EU and the international stage in the area of exclusive competence. In the area of shared competencies, um, the Commission shares this right with the member states, and that has proven to be quite a problematic area, as we're soon going to see um, illustrated by uh, one specific case. In the areas of shared competencies, as I mentioned already, the question is, has the EU become active, has it passed certain um, uh, legislative acts on EU level or not? Because if that is not the case, the competencies still lie with the member states. And what's crucial in this regard is the so-called ATER effect uh, that alludes to a decision of the European Court of Justice that was taken uh, in the 70s. And um, basically there the Commission took the Council to court. And um, the case was about these external competencies. And here the court said that when the European Union has passed, no matter what type of common rules in the areas of shared competencies, then member states lose their right to enter international agreements with third states that might affect those rules. And this uh, judicial decision has been put now also into practice and has been, uh, has been explicitly put into the treaty on the functioning of the European Union. So this is what underlines this relationship. I've put in here also actions to support, coordinate, and supplement the actions of the member states because here the Commission has a limited uh, representation empowerment um, as far as it has specific EU programs or initiatives in these areas, uh, for instance, in the area of sport, um, the Commission has become active. So this is basically the general framework. And here um, there is, again, another slide that illustrates um, the different levels. So again, we have the state of government level. In CFSP matters, we have the president of um, the um, European Council. Non-CFSP matters is the president of the European Commission. So um, as a little example, here we have the four such as the G8 or the G20, where both of them are represented. As far as the ministerial level is concerned, we have the high representative for CFSP matters and the, um, the different commissioners for non-CFSP matters. And then the administrative level high representative, of course, is uh, assisted by the external action service and the commissioners by the respective commission services. And as far as uh, the representation of third countries is concerned, here we have the EU um, delegations. So closely related, basically, to the um, representation of the European uh, Union in the international stage are, of course, negotiations of international agreements that are quite a crucial area. And here I've just put in uh, a little bit of information to illustrate this, to show you um, how crucial that is. Um, until now, the European Union has um, 739 bilateral agreements and uh, 231 multilateral agreements. And um, it has also become a member of uh, 39 international organizations. Here we have some questions that were related basically to the status of the EU, of the legal personality, which have been solved now with the Treaty of Lisbon. Before that, it was only the European community um, that had uh, these personalities. And, uh, but I won't dwell uh, really for a long time on this. Again, it's just for you um, to remember. And you can find a full list um, of all the different uh, agreements that the EU has in this area deal um, with the link that I have provided you with. Just another brief mentioning of the procedures with regard to the negotiations of international agreements. Um, this procedure is set out in Article 218 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. So basically here the Commission submits respective recommendations to the Council. And then it's the Council who decides, basically by qualified majority, it authorizes the opening of the negotiations, it gives directive to the uh, negotiator, and designates a special committee where member states are represented. Um, and to, to, to assist basically the negotiator in this process. It authorizes the signing of the agreement and concludes also the agreement. Throughout this whole process, the European Parliament is informed, and in certain cases that you are going to see here on the next slide, um, the European Parliament uh, has to give its consent for certain types of agreements. I won't uh, dwell uh, again for a long time on, on these different cases, because I just used the procedure to illustrate um, to you and uh, to help you understand better the next case I'm going to talk about, and that's the area of the shared competences where we have um, certain institutional problems. Um, I've chosen the Global Mercury Treaty case uh, because here we have negotiations basically of the United Nations um, 
environmental program and the aim of this year to bring member states um, together in Stockholm in June 2010 um, to negotiate a globally binding agreement on the discharge of uh, mercury into the environment for the um, time period of 2010 and 2013. And here we had a big struggle between the Commission and the Council about who is to lead the in international negotiations in this area. And the Commission here had basically um, the sense that um, since um, they have uh, been given by the treaties, especially by Article 17, uh, the power to represent the European Union on the international stage, they should be the sole negotiator in this area. Of course, the Council said, well, um, it's us who authorize, basically, uh, the, and choose the negotiator. So it's not um, the Commission who decides this um, this matter. So there was quite uh, a bit of friction uh, between the two institutions. At the end of the day, the uh, Council conceded the Commission and said, OK, um, you are going to be the sole negotiator with regard to the Global Mercury Treaty, with two minor exceptions. And these are the finances and capacity buildings, because this is a shared competency between the European Union and the different member states. And in these two areas, the member states basically have uh, still retained their competence to, to, to pass it. Um, binding rules. So what the Council did is uh, it, it passed a decision where it authorized the Commission to become the negotiator with the exception of these two areas where in, and these two areas were entrusted to the Council Presidency. And um, the Commission did not like this at all so what they did is they withdrew their proposal for the mandate of the negotiations and said that they were not going to negotiate at all. Of course, the Council here did not agree again with the Commission and said, well, um, you, dear Commission, are you not allowed to withdraw your initial proposal because we have taken already a decision. So um, everything looked like um, that uh, basically the prospects of one of these two institutions going to court are going to be very high. And what, um, what happened also in this international forum uh, of the negotiations is that um, the Commission was forced to say that there is no joint EU statement on the subject matter. And of course, everybody um, very knew why, because of this interinstitutional wrangling. So the question that one has to ask himself here is, um, what um, you know? What does this do to the um, stance of the EU in international in the international arena, if the EU cannot agree on a common stance? So, um, luckily, this matter was resolved later in, in, in December 2010, and the Council conceded completely to the stance of the Commission. So uh, they made the Commission the sole negotiator. But in the decision that they passed, they specified that the Commission is the sole negotiator only for the areas um, regarding the subject matter where the EU has already become active and passed uh, certain rules. And uh, there was also a specification in the decision saying that for all other areas where the member states have still retained um, their competence, um, there should be a cooperation between the member states and the Commission to ensure appropriate international representation. So this is how this problem was solved. But again, this area of shared competencies is quite a crucial one, and it's to be expected that's not the only um, area where there are going to be frictions between the Council and the Commission, and a little bit of a power fight. Um, it remains to see in what ways this is going to be resolved. But again, um, I would say this is just a matter of finding a political solution for these problems, because very often um, it's not easy to, to find a dividing line between different areas, for instance, where the CSSP and, and uh, the, the rest of EU competence begins. So uh, we have also a lot of international agreements where um, you have certain competencies that are entrusted to the Commission, but at the same time, the certain agreements also um, have certain aspects regarding CSSP. And how this has been solved in the past is that you have um, basically a joint delegation where, for instance, the Commission leads the delegation, but you will also have somebody from the high representative who is also uh, part of this delegation and negotiates uh, these parts um, of the agreement. So I think this is the way to go forward. Um, so, so much about this. Um, I just uh, wanted to mention in my last slide the role of the Commission and the Common Foreign Security Policy. Uh, just again as a reminder for all of you, um, we have here the European Council and the Council of the EU are the main players. So this is the, the instance that takes the decisions. We have the right 
high representative now um, that has been introduced by the Treaty of Lisbon that chairs um, the Council in this area and we have a very minor role for the European Commission and the European Parliament so the European Commission is not as strong as it is in the form of first pillar uh, or everything outside of CSSP now so it can submit proposals now together with the high representative but does not have the monopoly of initiatives so it can make certain proposals but uh, it's not sure whether these proposals are going to be taken on board by the Council However, the Commission is represented in all um, of these four, basically, in the Council. It's all different levels, uh, be it the level of uh, ministers, corporate level, or the different working groups, and um, it's heard. And the purpose of the Commission being there is also to ensure consistency. For instance, if we talk about the area of the common security and defense policy, um, we have um, uh, yeah, a lot of um, areas that overlap where the Commission also has certain actions um, and there it's really important for the Council to make sure that there's no duplication of efforts so um, the Commission is uh, considered also as an equal part, partner in that area. Um, the other uh, power that the Commission has uh, with regard to CSSP is that the it manages the CSSP budget line and that's quite a considerable power again because it's the power of the purse so the Commission ensures and checks whether the money has been spent properly, uh, sets up also the different um, guidelines for, for spending the money, so that's quite um, crucial. And I think here I come to the end of my uh, presentation. I hope um, that in this short period of time I managed to give you um, an overview of where the Commission stands, what the powers of the Commission are with regard to external representation and what the limits of this power and how the relations with the different institutions are. So and now I'm going to uh, pass back to Amelia and uh, to the next speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I shall be tackling the uh, issue of um, the European Council and intergovernmentalism, the topic on which I, I, I lectured in December. Um, <clears throat> right. Uh, it is fairly straightforward where we stopped, and that is with the following picture. This is the um, setting that we call the European Council. Now, <clears throat> who are we actually talking about? Well, as you can see, it are the um, heads of state or government of all individual EU member states, so all 27 prime ministers or presidents, plus the um, presidents of the European institutions, so the um, president um, of the European Council, Herman van Rompuy, plus uh, the Commission President uh, also, um, and if she likes to attend, the High Representative Lady Ashton. Now, the European Council is um, a format that uh, in theory meets uh, four times a year uh, to give what we call strategic direction to the entire European Union structure. Um, in practice, if things uh, are at risk of going desperately wrong, as was the case in, in 2011, the European Council will tend to meet more often. Um, I, uh, I checked this morning for the, the, the full count of, of, of last year, and we had six uh, complete European Council meetings, um, plus two uh, exceptional Eurozone uh, European Council meetings, so eight in total. Um, if I talk about strategic direction, what do I uh, actually mean? Well, uh, no matter the policy area, the European Council always constitutes supreme political authority in the European Union structure and can give direction uh, to everything that, that, that falls uh, within the, the remit of, of, of the structure. That also includes defining uh, what are exactly the rules of the game in the European Union and the rules of the game, uh, as you already know, they are codified by the treaties. So the European Council is also the, uh, this, uh, the, the body that um, can agree to change the treaties uh, as they um, have recently done. Now, in uh, the, the, the coming couple of minutes, uh, I shall be touching uh, on the one hand on the role of the European Council in the in the realm of foreign policy uh, and I will also be talking a bit about treaty change as it is currently a very topical subject. 
Um, but before um, before uh, jumping to the content, I wanted to make a few remarks when it comes to the actual methodology of how does the European Council work uh, in practice. And the method, it's fairly simple. It is bargaining between uh, individual member states. That means that it's typically um, a game of, of horse trading over specific, uh, specific dossiers. Um, as you will recall from my previous talk on on, uh, on uh, the realist perspective on uh, intergovernmental -govern relations, um, decisions typically uh, take the form of uh, lowest common denominators um, across the board of all individual positions uh, of the uh, of, of the member states. Of course, <clears throat> lowest common denominator games are not the representative for the full picture because there are a couple of other diplomatic maneuvers that, um, that, member, state, that member states can undertake. Um, and of course, depending on what member state you are, what is your weight in the system, um, the, um, the number of, uh, of extra diplomatic uh, levers of, uh, of, of, of power and influence, they will uh, well, be more numerous for some member states than for others. Um, one of the principal um, uh, tools that needs to be mentioned here is that um, a bunch of member states can, uh, of course, come to some sort of coalition and threaten to exclude one or more other uh, member states. The, the British have quite some experience in being excluded in the course of the um, uh, history of the European construction. Um, <clears throat> We'll come to that uh, at, a, at a later point uh, in time as well. Um, of course, apart from threatening to exclude uh, one or more member states, there is also the, the trick of linking um, several policy dossiers that are, in terms of content, entirely unrelated, but uh, the situation can arise where one or more member states say, okay, we accept a loss in this dossier, but then we definitely want a win in uh, that other dossier, uh, and in that sense, um, these points of winning and losing, uh, losses and gains, can be traded around so that uh, eventually um, uh, a summit of the, of, of the European Council can come to a consensus on multiple issues where um, some member states accept uh, uh, a compromise they don't entirely like on one issue, but to press forward uh, a compromise that they like more in another issue. Now, <clears throat> as I also said in, uh, in, in my lecture, there is something to be remembered about how um, big um, decision-making structures work in, in the political world. In the political world, contrary to, um, uh, to private enterprises, um, the uh, typical system for coming to, um, to decisions is by um, writing a whole lot of papers. So it starts with non-papers, food for thought papers, and gradually, uh, uh, with everybody writing papers, um, some, somebody takes the lead in trying to um, uh, form uh, a common vision that draws together uh, different, different elements. So if we want to study the decision-making process uh, of um, the European Council, something that some of of, uh, some of you may may want to do for for your MA thesis, etc. Um, these uh, common position papers, letters written by a bunch of member states, they often get leaked to to the to the media, etc. Uh, form the the prototypical research material that we can get uh, get access to 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 study the actual decision making process. Um, it can of course also be noted that as far as the alliances that emerge amongst member states, these are typically not set in stone, but they will depend on the issue at hand, uh, uh, and <clears throat> they, can, they, they can shift uh, across uh, different, uh, different policy realms, also, or also um, over, uh, over time, of course. Now, uh, let's jump to um, some content. As far as the role of the European Council, in uh, foreign policy is concerned, it's actually fairly limited because what the European Council typically does is, well, define the overall principles and strategies for the European Union. So um, 
the 2003 European Security Strategy, uh, one of the most readable uh, documents in uh, EU foreign policy. That was uh, a document, a very weighty document, that was agreed to um, at the level of um, uh, heads of state and government. Um, once these um, documents, um, the overarching strategies are agreed to, typically the, um, the heads of state and government, they, they delegate uh, all the practical work uh, on nitty-gritty decision-making on, on individual issues uh, away to their uh, foreign ministers that meet in the Foreign Affairs Council um, and there, for example, uh, the council decisions for setting up CSDP operations and civilian missions are taken at, at, at that level uh, and typically the, the foreign ministers will also um, take, uh, well, or identify common positions at the EU level uh, in specific policy uh, dossiers. Um, as was already mentioned earlier, in theory, um, QMV voting is, is possible in, uh, in a narrowly defined set of cases, for example, for example the, assign, the assigning of a special representative for a geographical region, but in practice, uh, it, uh, it, it never happens really. So uh, all the, uh, the decision making is actually intergovernmentalism on, on a basis of, 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 a, of a consensus rule. Now, <clears throat> as far as the European Council is concerned, what you should bear in mind is that if, if the politics get really, really uh, delicate, at that point in time, the heads of state uh, and government, they will draw the uh, responsibility to themselves again. So, for example, we currently see that um, there is uh, a lot of commotion uh, on, uh, on, on the theme of Iran's nuclear uh, program. Um, well, we actually see that in the, Council, in the European Council conclusions of the last meeting in, uh, in December, there was actually a couple of paragraphs specifically on Iran because this was um, the real stuff of, of, of hard, of hard uh, power politics where the, um, uh, the heads of state do not delegate responsibility away to the, uh, to the foreign ministers, but they de decide for themselves, well, actually, yes, we are going to push ahead with European sanctions against Iran. We will let the, the foreign ministers and the administration settle, uh, like, um, uh, work out the actual details, but the principal decision uh, on, on, on the really important stuff, well, as you can imagine, that are the decisions that are being made uh, at the level of the, of the heads of state. The most important decisions, however, probably constitute the decisions that relate to treaty change, because you always need to keep in mind that um, the question of how the European Union works from the perspective of the national capitals, that is actually a foreign policy question as well. Um, and in, in that sense, it's probably the most important foreign policy dossier for uh, pretty much all uh, EU member states deciding how they run the, the, the continent to which they, uh, they all belong. Now, <clears throat> how does treaty change actually go about? Well, there is something called the Intergovernmental Conference Procedure. Uh, that is described in the, uh, in, in, in the Treaty on the European Union, uh, Article 48, to be precise. Um, so uh, if the uh, European Council says, well, we need to change the treaties for one reason or another, uh, they simply say, we are going to change the treaties and we shall uh, all appoint um, uh, or send a delegation to an intergovernmental conference where we will uh, try to hammer out a compromise deal uh, on, uh, on what will be changed. What is quite interesting, and we covered this uh, in, in more detail in class, is that um, during negotiations on, on treaty change, you very often have similar discussions recurring ever and ever again uh, in, the, in the wider history of, of, of the European Union. So, uh, for example, the, the current discussion on what is exactly the position of the United Kingdom vis-à-vis -vis the entire project of European integration, it's not a new, it's not a new uh, issue, of course. It's, it's, it's been right there from, from the very beginning. And if you now read rather old academic articles, for example, the one we read um, by Moravchik on the Single European Act, you actually discover, well, these, thing, the, these issues never really went away. They, they were perhaps brushed under the carpet, but uh, they're recurring ever 
uh, every every time um, again, because at the end of the day, what treaty change is really about, well, it's actually about calibrating the political power of the individual member states, and also, well, the definition of what powers will be delegated away from the national capitals to the European institutions, uh, and of course, <clears throat> Um, different member states have, have long-standing national traditions in how they uh, in how they perceive uh, this 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 whole package, uh, and that makes it um, so um, so salient. Um, <clears throat> okay, I shall perhaps wrap up with uh, a brief uh, commentary uh, on uh, on current affairs, namely the the, the rocky road. Uh, towards economic union, if we can uh, call it uh, like that, um, you can probably say that. Um, well, it's a gross simplification, of course, but that the whole problem uh, originated in the fact that eurozone crisis involving banks, uh, uh, involving uh, lenders and borrowers, uh, at the end of the day, started involving uh, governments, uh, which led to a freeze in um, national bond markets. Um, and if national bond markets freeze, then governments are in uh, pretty big trouble, uh, as the Greeks recently found out. Um, all previously agreed solutions uh, were deemed by the international markets to be insufficient. Um, <clears throat> and at the uh, Council, European Council meeting in October, they tasked Herman van Homper to draft a report to strengthen on how to provide ideas on how to strengthen economic convergence, improve budgetary discipline of the, uh, amongst the member states, and how to deepen economic union within the euro area. Then in December, uh, only a few weeks ago, we had a very um, emotional and heated um, uh, meeting of the European Council where uh, a, a big push was made uh, by Germany for uh, changing the treaties. Um, and as you will recall, uh, at that point in time, um, the British said, hmm, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, and uh, a decision was made to um, uh, push forward um, uh, with uh, 26 members, so thereby excluding the United Kingdom. So you see, well, the negotiating tactics, uh, well, they often, they sometimes get, get illustrated uh, in practice in a very, very clear-cut way. Now, how all this is going to, to end um, that is, it's, uh, it's far too early to uh, make, a, make a call on that. Um, here you see uh, how a British cartoonist uh, perceived things uh, at the time. Um, it is, of course, a very salient political debate because Germany is de facto um, uh, making use of a, a rather powerful position it finds itself in, um, in, uh, in, in, in the current political context. Uh, but of course, um, Germany is not the, uh, the the only player in in the European system. So all the other member states will uh, have some uh, some difficult thinking ahead on how to um, on how to come to a new uh, stable system. But that will probably take uh, quite a couple of, uh, of of extra months or even years to to come about. Um, I'll stop here and look forward to uh, any questions that may arise. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexander, for uh, a, a breathless presentation. I'm now going to turn over uh, finally to Katya. Thanks so much, Katya. So thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to turn to another very important European institution, namely the European Parliament. But not only that, I was also asked to talk about the ordinary procedure and the open method of coordination. So this is really a lot for 10 minutes. I'm going to do my best to uh, not keep you away from your lunch too long. Um, and basically what uh, I'm going to look at is, first of all, what is the European Parliament? Where does it come from? What does it do? What are its roles? And then looking at the legislative procedure, which is now since Lisbon Treaty called the ordinary procedure, formerly the co-decision procedure. And then turning to another sort of new mode of governance, um, which is the open method of coordination and which differs very much from the ordinary legislative procedure. And then in the end coming back to what that all um, has, well, 
what that tells us to, uh, about foreign and security policy and what the role of the European Parliament in foreign and security policy is, which is the overall theme of this course, of course. So the European Parliament, uh, and I'm going to go very quickly through that, it is an old institution actually. It was already mentioned in uh, the original Euro, um, European Coal and Steel Community. And um, at the time it was called the Common Assembly. It did not have legislative powers and it was a dual mandate, which means that the national parliaments actually delegated members of the parliament to this common assembly. So they had the mandate of the national parliament and also of the common assembly. And they were not elected uh, directly by the people of the member states at the time. Um, then in the Rome Treaty, the, it was called European Parliamentary Assembly. And what happened then is that actually, the well, I call it the parliament now already, um, that it gained some limited budgetary powers. And that actually played a very big role throughout the history of the European Parliament because although in these early years they did not have the power to talk and decide about legislation as such, but they had some powers and increasingly more in its history to veto budget, to have to give its assent on the budget, which is a very important and um, strategic power that the Parliament used very strategically, so um, linking its approval of the part of the budget to other policies, to other uh, measures that the Parliament actually wanted to uh, see in European policy. In '62, the European Parliament called itself European Parliament, and then um, later on, that was also codified in the treaties. And um, already in the '60s, actually, the European Parliament or the Assembly at the time. Um, introduced a proposal for direct um, universal elections, um, which were not implemented immediately. The Council actually only adopted uh, the necessary uh, legislation and rules in the 70s. And in 79, finally, the first elections of the European Parliament through direct universal suffrage took place. In, um, in the 80s, then, the legislative powers of the parliament increased um, through, in the Single European Act, the cooperation procedure first, and then later in the Maastricht Treaty and Amsterdam Treaties uh, through the co-decision procedure, which um, I'm going to talk about now, which now is called the Ordinary Procedure. Um, so this was a very quick run through the history of the European Parliament, and um, and well, maybe that counts for everything I must say. If you, if you need more information, if you want more detail, uh, please feel free to contact me, and uh, I can give you many more, um, info, much more information, and many more um, articles that you can read about that. Um, what I put here is. Just an overview, which you, you find the reference in, in the slide, um, of the elections of the European Parliament. Because although we have direct universal um, suffrage, it's actually the, the, the elections and the methods and the, the system that are being used are, differ a bit. So, and, and, to you, and I don't go through that, but some countries have a single constituency, some countries have um, as for example in the case of Germany, there are different lenders as constituencies. Some of them have a threshold, some of them don't. Um, so there are still differences in the way how members of the European Parliament uh, are elected. And also the representation per capita differs a lot. Um, I think that's in this table as well. So if you look at, um, at Germany, for example, you have one MEP representing 830,000 830, Germans, while um, Malta, which would be on the next slide, um, Malta, there's, they have one MEP per 82,000 inhabitants. So you would have a, a quite a big um, difference between actually how many people one of these members of parliament represent. And um, so, well, they are elected by the, the peoples of, uh, of Europe, but what does the parliament actually do? And, uh, and it has, well, you can group it in three different kinds of roles, 
three different um, powers that the parliament does. And one is legislative, and that's actually one that we're going to look at later. Um, it can, the parliament is involved in the ordinary procedure and also in other procedures, the consultation procedure where it's consulted, or the consent procedure where it has to give its consent. And the parliament can also, they don't have to sit around and wait until the European Commission proposes a law that then they can um, discuss, but they can also um, initiate reports. So they can draft reports, they can request the European Commission to become active on on legislation and to make a legislative proposal. And that actually is something that occurred in uh, in the 80s. In 82, the Commission um, agreed actually that it will follow up on initiative reports by the European Parliament. And that was uh, then enshrined now in the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, where the European Parliament, by majority of its composing uh, members, may request the Commission to submit um, appropriate proposals on issues that it'd like to see um, to be addressed by European legislation. Although the European Parliament, although the European Commission could then, well, be very slow in, th in its response or propose a law that is not necessarily what the Parliament had in mind. Um, but, but nevertheless, this is something that the Parliament has also used already before these rights were enshrined in the treaty, um, just simply by issuing reports, by pointing to different issues that it would like to see um, addressed that it saw um, maybe not being appropriately addressed in the European Union. And just through this publicity, the European Parliament could already influence policy without having the official um, powers that um, are resulting from the treaty. And then, so the second role is the budgetary role. And that's something that I also mentioned already before, which played a big role initially in the Parliament gaining more power. So it actually um, could early on decide or had to give its consent on certain aspects, certain um, uh, funding lines of the budget and um, and could use that power to get more um, more power in other areas. And today it's um, the parliament decides on the entire budget on the multi-annual financial framework as well as on the annual budget. And then the third role is the supervision of the executive, so of the European Commission. And that's also something that uh, has increased over time. And what we have in the Lisbon Treaty today is that it's actually mentioned that the president of the European Commission should, uh, well, or that the, the candidate that is being chosen by the Council, uh, by the European Council, um, sh should reflect the elections of the European Parliament, trying to make it more like a nation, nation state, so um, trying to have the U President of the European Commission coming from the party that gained the most votes in the elections. And then also the European Parliament has to give its consent to the College of the Commissioners. And that is something that uh, is also very, very serious nowadays, so all, every commissioner um, is literally being grilled in the European Parliament. They're being questioned on um, yeah, on their background, on the policies um, that they would like to implement, and only then the Parliament gives its consent. And also because the Parliament can dismiss the College of the Commissioner, um, which actually almost happened uh, in, uh, in the case of the Sancho Commission, which then um, resigned uh, voluntarily. Um, and then we have a number of other supervisory uh, roles that I'm not going to go into detail. But so the Commission very much monitors what the uh, sorry the Parliament monitors very much what the Commission is doing, and uh, brings transparency and accountability into this uh, into the EU um, system through that. So how does it work? The Parliament. Well, now in the in the Lisbon Treaty, it is written that the number of members of the European Parliament is limited to 750 plus one president. So that's how we end up with a 751. And um, but I think as is always the case with changes of treaties, 
there um there were some transitional periods and um so but that's basically what we what we're now what we, what what um yeah what we we're now uh, working with um and at the moment there are 20 committees and i just copy pasted the list of these committees into the slide so that really ranges from foreign affairs which i guess is important for this lecture or for this course but it also is um in economic affairs in the women's rights and gender equality so really the whole um spectrum of different policies and these committees would meet they discuss they are the first ones to actually uh, discuss legislative proposals and uh, other documents and before these documents and reports uh, reach the plenary session of the entire parliament and we have seven political groups currently in the european parliament um which i now put on this slide just that's the current uh, distribution we have the epp the european people's party which has the most seats and the second one is the um other socialists and uh, democrats but we also have greens and uh, various other groups, so the Nordic left, um, Europe of Freedom and Dem Democracy, and uh, yeah, conservatives and Euro uh, reformists, I think they're called. So, um, so we do have quite a spectrum of different um, parties being represented in the European Parliament. And another thing is that, that which is quite specific to the European Parliament, which the press often make fun of and which is I would say tragically funny the European Parliament actually is a traveling circus still so in Brussels uh, in the building that I guess most of us know um, there are the committee meetings there are the meetings of the parliamentary groups of the different parties there are also mini plenary sessions and um, parliamentarians spend most of their time in Brussels but they also go to Strasbourg for their plenary sessions and in Luxembourg, they still have um, a large part of their administration. So basically, that's why every member of the European Parliament has something like this in its um, in their offices. So this is the calendar for last year. So they would see the red weeks are, I think, the plenary sessions. So that's when they have to go to Strasbourg, and then um, the other ones are committee weeks. And there also are constituency weeks when these uh, members of the European Parliament are allowed to or meant to go home to actually talk to the people that they are representing. So um, they are quite busy and uh, and traveling between different places. So this was really, yeah, I guess in broad brush strokes, how the P European Parliament works, where it comes from, and um, how it's being elected. Now moving more to the legislative procedures, and there I put on as the first one the ordinary procedure, um, which is the one that I like to talk about a bit more. But there are many others. So that's the consultation procedure where the Parliament's being consulted, consent where it has to give its consent. But there are also procedures where um, actually the Commission and the Council adopt legislation, and the Parliament is um, yeah kept outside. The Commission can adopt legislation where Council and Parliament are not really involved. Then you would also have the comitology procedure, which is implementing um, EU legislation, where also the Parliament has limited roles. It gains more roles or more influence now, but that's also more the member states that are being um, involved in that procedure. But yes, yeah, you can already tell, and then there's also special procedures. We can't go through all of them because then we would it would take until tonight. Um, but moving to the ordinary procedure, and I just copy pasted this nice diagram from the website of the European Commission into three slides actually because it can fit into one. Um, and this slide now is the first reading. So how does it start? The whole, the official procedure actually starts with the proposal from the Commission. So the European Commission works on a legislative proposal and sends that to the European Parliament and the Council. But of course, this proposal doesn't just come, it doesn't fall out of the sky. Actually, what's not in this official procedure, but um, what is very important is that there's a long um, process prior to this legislative pro um, proposal where the Commission does 
stakeholder consultations, impact assessments, and also, as we already saw earlier, the Parliament can do initiative reports. So it can actually request um, the uh, Commission to draft a legislative pro a proposal. And you also, of course, have member states, for example, lobbying the Commission and or requesting um, to uh, the Commission to work on a on a law and to propose it. And then also you would have various other stakeholders um, being involved in re requesting, trying to shape a proposal before it's actually officially introduced into that procedure. So, um, so there's a lot going on before what I uh, talk about here in this slide. But then once the Commission submitted a proposal to the Parliament and to the Council, they start their first reading. And uh, in that first reading, the Council um, votes or adopts its decisions by um, qualified majority vote. And that means that, well, still, we're now still working under what was in the Nice Treaty. So until 1st of November 2014, qualified majority vote means that at least 55% of the members of the Council um, comprising 65% of the population have to agree to, um, oh no, sorry, sorry, yeah. Now I, that was already a list one one. The, the one, um, the, the old one is actually that at least 255 votes um, representing a majority of the members have to agree to a legislation. And then still a member state that doesn't agree can request that it's being checked whether actually 62% of the population are being represented by these um, member states that agreed to uh, the, the, the respective decision. And then as of 1st of November 2014, the Lisbon rules will hit in. And that's then that at least 55% of the members of the council that are involved in that decision. So meaning if you would have enhanced co um, cooperation situations, it would not be all 27, of course, um, and comprising at least 65% of the population of these states. And then um, you have, of course, as all rules of the EU are complicated, a uh, blocking minority. So if 35% of the population uh, of participating participating member states plus one member are against the decision, then um, they can actually block this decision. So very complicated and I think you know you might want to read that. Um, and the European Parliament, they decide uh, by the majority of the, their representing members. So we have all this position and then um, what happens in many cases actually, in 60% of the ordinary procedure cases, um, there is a first reading agreement. So you would have the Council and the Parliament actually agreeing on, uh, on a law and then it stops. But what happens if they disagree? If the European Parliament adopts um, a report and the Council adopts um, a first reading position and they don't match, then we go into the second reading. Thing. And then the second reading actually does have time limits. So while this first thing um, can take a long time, there you still have a lot of lobbying, position finding, and uh, and it could take a year or longer until the first reading procedure is over. For the second um, reading, the Parliament and the Council actually have three months. So three months after uh, receiving the Council and the Commission opinion, the European Parliament has to take its second reading opinion, uh, a decision or report. And um, also the Parliament, uh, the Council. So there again, you have the Council acting by qualified majority vote, except for cases for amendments of the European Parliament that the Commission does not agree to. So you have um, the Commission that gives its opinion on the amendments of the European Parliament. And if the Commission does not agree with an EP amendment, then the Council actually can't vote by qualified majority vote, but has to adopt this European Parliament amendment that the Commission does not agree with by unanimity. And then um, again in the second reading, if an agreement is found between the, the Council and the European Parliament, then the um, law is adopted and can be signed and published. If not, there's a possibility of a third reading, which is called um, the conciliation. 
and there this is really just for the final touches for for very few controversial issues that still remained after these two readings and there again you know the, the screws are tightened a bit further um there the, the council uh, sorry yeah the council and the european parliament actually have to take a decision within six weeks after the conciliation committee being convened and the conciliation committee um, is composed of members of the parliament and the council and also um, the commission so and ideally there are still some technical details that are being uh, discussed and then agreed upon in this committee and then these the the conciliation outcome has to be adopted by the parliament and the council and if both institutions agree then the law is adopted otherwise if still in its third reading in this conciliation procedure, um, there's still no agreement between the Parliament and the Council, then the law is not adopted and um, the whole procedure uh, ended without a result. And the laws are finally, well, enter into force once they're being signed by the President of the Parliament and the Council and published in the official journal of the European Union. So, um, yeah, I hope I confused all of you now. Um, this is just a slide where uh, an author, well, Neil Nugent, um, counted in which procedures actually ended after the first reading, second reading, or third reading. And, and that shows that most of the cases, over 60% of the Commission proposals, are actually being adopted in the first reading. So this whole procedure of uh, not agreeing and not agreeing and, and that actually does not happen as often as you would think. It's only really just 10% of the uh, of the legislative proposals, I guess the bigger ones, the more controversial ones, that are only being decided in the conciliation procedure. Um, so, and now, but one thing that you might wonder is what if what happens for areas that can't be decided through EU law, that can't be decided um, in this um, ordinary procedure, that are maybe not in or not entirely in the EU competence? And there, there's a, well, what you can call a new mode of governance, the open method of coordination. And that's something that's fairly recent. It, um, it was initially applied to the Lisbon Goals in the 2000s. So the Lisbon agenda was about competitiveness and the EU becoming the world's competitive, uh, most competitive um, region of the world. And um, and this is really something that's very different. It's uh, something where the European Parliament actually doesn't have many roles uh, or not much influence, much more driven by the mem uh, by the member states and an, a more intergovernmental um, process actually. And one other major difference is that it's voluntary. So it's really a voluntary process of political cooperation based on the member states, all of them agreeing common goals and objectives and the commission monitoring it. So how does it work? Um, the Council of Ministers, together with the commission, agrees goals, guidelines, timetables, um, benchmarks and indicators that, are, that they all want to achieve, each of them individually and together. And then the member states go home, they transpose these guidelines, um, they involve different stakeholders, and then they report to the Commission on what they've done and what the results were. And then the Commission evaluates the outcome and um, does these kind of benchmarks, so re produces reports where it um, highlights very good examples and maybe shames and blames um, examples that were not very successful. And the whole rationale behind that is that you have um, mutual learning that different member states learn from the best practices of the better member states and that through this um, yeah, very blurred um, cooperative uh, process uh, member state policies will um, converge and will achieve the common goals that were set, set initially. So what's the aim? It's really to achieve greater convergence amongst the EU member states, but not to harmonize. That's a big difference between this ordinary procedure that I mentioned earlier. There you have EU laws, you have EU directives, EU regulations um, that actually have to be implemented by everyone and, and certain factors are being um, harmonized. But this open method of coordination is just 
about convergence, not everyone has to do the same, just achieving um, the same goals. And um, and then you can already tell from that that it's applied in different areas, in policy areas where actually you can't apply the ordinary procedure because the EU doesn't have competences. So um, it's uh, it's mainly applied in areas where the EU doesn't have competences, in areas where uh, that are very controversial, where member states can't really agree on harmonisation. Um, and also this open method of coordination, it's not really oh, sorry. It's not really mentioned in the Lisbon Treaty. It's it's not specified. This whole procedure that I outlined is applied in very different um, forms in different policy areas. And the only thing that you actually have is an Article 5 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union where um, it's being talked about the cooperation in economic employment and social policy between the member states. And um, so that's actually the only real reference that you can find. Um, so now I've really rushed through all of these things, um, and my last slide is just about so what what does that have to do with foreign and security policy, and uh, and so the role of the European Parliament in foreign and security policy I was actually already talked about by Alina, and I didn't want but I don't really have anything to add um, to that. The Parliament has very limited roles in foreign and security policy. As we heard from Alexander, there is still it's a lot of intergovernmental policy making. So what the Parliament does is what it has been doing also in the early years when it didn't have many competences at all. It, um, it's being consulted, it monitors, it scrutinizes, it produces reports, it tries to um, hold different actors accountable, it tries to highlight um, different things, it tries to yeah, get involved without really having um, uh, powers that are enshrined in the treaty. And again, here we have something that we heard earlier that the Parliament used in the course of its history, and that's the budgetary um, power. So the Parliament um, has to, uh, or is involved in um, in the budget, in uh, agreeing uh, expenditures of, of foreign and security policy without military and defense impl um, implications. So, um, yeah. Thank you very much. That was my um, quick run through these three aspects. Thank you very much, Katya and Alina and Alexander. Um, it was a, uh, an absolutely whirlwind uh, tour. Uh, I'm not surprised that we're uh, we're over time. Um, so I just want to end by showing you one or two of the uh, the final slides um, that uh, show what we're up to here uh, at the IES. Uh, the next of our uh, Wednesday webinar series. Uh, is on the, the 25th of January, uh, Terrorist Finance Tracking, which is a really fantastic title, uh, Any Privacy Left. And this, this is a very interesting area, I think. So if you have um, um, uh, less perfect knowledge on this than you'd like to develop, <laughs> this is certainly the thing for you. Um, and then um, the, the next of the Jean Monnet uh, webinars is on the 7th of March. Um, and there we're going to be talking uh, about uh, the near neighborhood, so the European Union's roles um, in, uh, in, in the near neighborhood, and also its um, uh, contribution with regards to the United Nations and NATO, and that's going to be by uh, Joachim Kutz. So that will be a very fascinating one to, to attend as well. Next week, uh, for those of you um, bemused or befuddled uh, by the labyrinth of opportunities in the European Union for research funding, I highly recommend to you and to your colleagues to attend our two-day workshop on EU research funding. Um, it's been designed to explain some of the more uh, difficult, uh, less well understood uh, tranches of EU funding and some of the um, sort of the language that tends to get in the way and, and, and prevent us from understanding how to actually apply. So the first day reviews all sorts of funding, and the second day is, is a research factory uh, in which we have uh, Professor Andrew Darrington coming from development, uh, coming from um, uh, Liverpool to develop the idea um, that you may have in your head. So you think, oh, this is a good idea, but I don't know how to put it in practice. And he will take you by the hand for two hours and lead you from, from inception to uh, a concrete research proposal, which is a very invaluable um, series.
the skills. So I would urge you to, to do that. If you're interested, simply email me and we'll be happy to uh, add you uh, to, to, to the list. There's a, a small but very reasonable fee, I think. Uh, 6th to the 8th of February, it's the three-day um, EU and close-up intensive course. So it's effectively the last hour, but spread across three days, uh, which some of you might uh, might enjoy and find uh, find uh, reasonable. Um, and then um, in terms of webinars, uh, Educational Development Unit is very happy to, to launch um, a series of, of four um, webinars occurring weekly entitled Decoding the EU. And it's very similar again to what we've had today, except we'll spend one uh, one after or one lunchtime I should say on each of the institutions. Um, we're going to also include some practitioners as well. So this is a combination of in-house expertise and also um, external practitioners. Um, I noticed that we've we've got really only a minute or two left, and we can't really um, expect people to to hang around um, too too much. I can see um, there's a question um, there uh, by by Alexander um, um, Gallo. I'm just going to see if I can quickly read through it. What can be done in the organization structure to improve the functioning for the EAS? For example, revisions on certain provisions and reallocation of competences. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's fair to say that the structure at this point um, is, is a combination um, of, of thematic and also um, uh, desk officer positions, which is not unlike um, the, the, the diplomatic structure in, in, in member states. But there does seem to be a lot of duplication, um, not just within the EEAS, but across the EEAS and, and the Commission as well. So I, I would certainly agree um, that uh, looking at the, the, the division of labor and the, the thematic division within the EEAS is, is going to be needed. I'd like to encourage that uh, the idea of a much, much larger budget <laughs> uh, be, be put forward because I, I don't feel with regards to the numbers um, of stuff um, and, and budget allocated. It can be anything other than a sort of um, an adjunct at this point. Um, a reallocation of competences, of course, is a treaty matter. Uh, and I don't know if the, uh, the EAS at this point has proved um, exceptionally competent enough to be able to um, suggest to member states that uh, they should devolve more powers in this area rather than less. I think they have to do uh, a little more work um, in, in, in that term. Um, I don't see any more questions um, actually, are written. Because only the last one you touched upon here. So there's more. But there's many more. I'm only the last one. I can see. Yes, there's, there's, there's a lot more. I'm afraid I think if, if there's other ones here, we'll have to uh, for Wei Yin Chen, for, um, we'll have to type back um, uh, in, in a way that um, responds to you a little bit more, more thoroughly. Katya, are you able to, to, to hear us and to, to respond to the question? I just looked, uh, I wanted to say that I'm already in the process of replying through the chat. So um, I'll do that by chat. Okay, thank no? you very much, Katya. Um, in that case, um, if uh, Katya is going to respond by chat, that's fine. I'm going to um, draw the, the, the live element um, to, to a close. To thank you all very much indeed, um, to, to wish you good luck uh, with the next couple of weeks. Most of you have uh, exams to prepare for, um, and I look forward to seeing you um, in, uh, in, in the next webinar. Take care. Thank you very much. Goodbye, all.